Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining me on Culture Chat today. It's my honor. Yes, yes. Thank well, you for inviting me. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, we we spoke off air a little bit. We have a lot of the you know same friends. We 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 move in the same circle. So it's just fine. It's about time that we had this conversation. I'm glad we could make it happen. All right. I it's been like an insane 12 months for the world, uh, let alone uh, here in the U.S. and everything. But like literally the whole world has been like turned upside down. And so I just like to kind of start with like, how are you? How have things been for you and your family? Things have been kind of wild. I mean, it's it's been crazy. My parents who are here visiting me, visiting, I say in quotes, um, from Delaware um, came right before the pandemic hit. Uh, and then when the pandemic hit, they were like, you know, they're elderly, so they didn't exactly feel that safe as far as traveling back. So they've been here with me, um, which I've been trying to cajole them into doing, into moving here for over a decade. But they've been here now uh, continuously for over a year. So it's been, it's been in one sense a little bit unsettling for them, like a disruption in their natural flow and plan of things. But on the other hand, it's been great because we've gotten to spend so much time as a family and they've gotten to spend so much time with my kids which has been outstanding so oh there's gosh. there's been a lot of opportunity in in the weirdness of of pandemic wow that's crazy so they came out to visit and then literally they're they're stuck there for like a year now we're, we're coming on like one year since all the lockdowns and i i've been looking to california because i'm over in crazy florida and like we get to fight for who's handling this pandemic worse and how, how bad things are going florida I, to me florida always quote unquote wins because it's just such a cluster here but um i know things are absolutely <laughs> insane there i mean it's it's just it's crazy yeah, uh, you know, it's crazy in, in some sense, I think, because there's no uniformity, right? Like there's there's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of people throwing out their opinions and not a lot of context. Um, and also, unfortunately, in what seems to be a metabolic illness, because people's metabolisms are so different, people's biomes are so different, people's blood chemistries are so different, you're going to see different manifestations of the illness. Uh, and because people see different manifestations, they go like, oh, well, then it must be a hoax. It must be this. It must be that rather than going like it's attacking people differently based on what you come to the table with and so um our inability to contextualize is once again screwing us <laughs> and the media <laughs> Yeah, there's certainly that too. Yeah, so as a doctor, because this is fascinating, you, um, for our listeners who are just meeting you for the first time, you have this amazing background of integrating medicine and martial arts and strength training and movement and so many different things. Um, and so, you know, I, I, of course, connect with you on so many levels. And I wonder, like, how, what kind of advice do you give to someone as, as we are hopefully heading out of this madness, but also like throughout it, right? So we've been telling people, keep your immune system up, get stronger. Health is the last thing you want to neglect at this point in time. But I would like to hear from you since you have such a unique um, qualification and expertise in that area. Like what have you been sharing with people in order to not just doing the whole, you know, mask up physical distance, but from like a health standpoint? Sure. I, I think at least in this country, I can only speak to, to my own experience um, and most of what I see. I think in general, in this country, in the States, uh, a lot of our biggest problem is that we think more is more rather than less is more. So more food is better, more training is better, more of a workout is better, more intensive a workout is better, more hours of work is better rather than quality. Um, and so our inability to recognize or take the time to invest in learning about employing and then optimizing those qualities, I think are, are putting us in a bit of a bind. Um, when it comes to food, for example, like uh, we've, you know, how like with, with Chinese people, right? Like the, the, one of the greetings is like, they see Zofa made it. Right. So like, it's always <laughs> you like, did yet? you eat yet? <laughs> right. And so like, if you, if you answer in the negative, then it's like, oh my God, like, are you okay? Like, let's get you some food. Rather than like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. I just, you know, I'm not hungry. Or maybe today I'm fasting. And we know now that, you know, through fasting, sometimes that's one of the key ways of kicking on our immune system. But 
try and explain that to someone from the old country. And it's like, no, 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 you have to eat to keep your strength up to do. And it's a different paradigm, you know, because of context again. Um, if we were living in a predominantly like manual labor type lifestyle where we're putting out high physical exertion um, and there's also nutritional instability, meaning like I don't know when my next meal is, then yeah, then that, that oh, you must eat is, is really um, more appropriate. But I think one of the things that people don't understand these days, especially in a country where food is fairly readily available for, for people of that demographic, is that like you actually are healthier with less um, because you train your body metabolically to make use of what you take in. Um, and one of my friends all, all, likes to use the phrase opportunistic omnivore. Humans evolved as opportunistic omnivores. So it's like, we don't need to always eat meat. We don't need to always eat, eat vegetables. We don't like, we should be able to um, change our food sources. And the more we can change our food sources and train our bodies to be metabolically adaptable, then we are more resilient. We are more robust. Um, and so like to, to train our bodies that like we are always going to have food at this exact time and this exact amount and these exact proportions and this exact flavor, we become rigid, we become weak. So I think that's something that uh, I would love to see more educators speak on. I would love to see more um, medical professionals address as well. Yeah, one of the things that I often get frustrated about is I'll take my um, mom or mother-in-law or someone to the doctor and they immediately, oh, well, you're on the borderline for high BP or high cholesterol, so here's a pill. You know, there's no discussion on nutrition and health and, and fitness and, and working out or what else, are there other options? Like I am not anti-medicine. I, if, if you need a specific treatment for a, 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 a major disease, I'm all about it. I've, I've got the vaccines. I'm, I'm not, um, you know, everything has to be holistic, but I just find it incredible that, especially in the United States and coming from a Chinese background, right? That a lot mm -hmm. of it is, um, you know, we do ginger tea. If you start coming down, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do naturally, right? So I just find it frustrating that there's not a lot from Western medicine in the nutrition side and that I find that it's a very outdated. Like they're still, you know, not really kind of keeping up with what I think a lot of the science tells us, like what you just shared with different things of food and not everything works for the same person, but it's just like, the lowest thing on the recommendation list when you go to a lot of doctors. And I get it. They don't have a lot of time. They see a patient. They've got their 15 minutes. It's in and out. Most patients don't want to put in the work. Um, but if you don't have a caretaker to go with someone to the doctor and say, no, 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 wait, can they do this, this, and this? Will this be better? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Are you willing to help them do that? Then yeah, you don't need this pill yet, right? Like you're not in, a, in that serious phrase, but like, um, there's just that frustration. And so what do you think can be done? Like you said, there's no education out there, but is it, is it us as the patients that need more education or is it the doctors that need more education? Because I really find Honestly, the nutrition thing is lacking. Yeah, I think it's both. And I think we're lucky because we live in a time when there are people like podcasters, Drew Perohit or, and his, and the, his partner, Dr. Mark Hyman, um, you know, for me, as a, as a person whose doctorate is in Chinese medicine and acupuncture, it's always cool to see people who are MDs and DOs and people who are quote unquote Western, um, who understand that there's that context that, that needs to be respected more as far as diet, as far as movement, as far as mindset. Um, and as far as just simple things, like things that we take for granted, like breathing, like how do you optimize your breathing? Chinese people have been talking about hei gong, qi gong, or breathing exercises since time immemorial. Um, but it's amazing how many, how many people in, uh, the modern fitness or modern wellness world are just now starting to pay attention to that. Um, and what we didn't do, um, or maybe we tried our best as Chinese immigrants to do is like share the exercises, okay. but we couldn't really, we couldn't really contextualize in the Western standpoint, quite the way that people needed to be able to wrap their brains around it. So now when we talk about, okay, some of these exercises that you do as far as posture, as far as breathing and expanding the abdomen or controlling the contraction in the abdomen, like actually trains you for diaphragmatic control and 
pelvic floor uh, activity and uh, you know things like that, then if we can use the speech or use the terminology that people can wrap their brains around in a Western framework, then you know it, I think it's a lot more palatable, a lot more digestible. So now our generation, like you and me, I think in a lot of ways, we're the first generation to be able to grab onto that, to really be that bridge. Yeah, I, so I, I, as I far love as, No, no, no. I was just going to say, I, I love that you just kind of shared that because I feel like you just articulated everything that um, in the last 10 years or so, I've been really coming to realize a lot more. So of course, I teach traditional Kung Fu and, you know, coming from someone who's learned from their father, it's not like you could ask like a million questions. Why do you do this? Or what, how come this or that? You know, you don't ask, right? Like that's not really part of the tradition, but right. it's been wonderful for me to learn from a lot of people way smarter than me, way more knowledgeable in terms of the fitness and um, science side of things, science-based, you know, movement and understanding, you know, why you're, knee and your toes should be lined up so that you're not tearing your MCL or ACL. Like there's just like, it makes sense when I do something physically, but I was never able to articulate, like you said, the science behind it or like kind of bridging that gap. And my husband, Oscar has been a huge help with that because he just loves um, hearing from experts such as yourself and kind of talk and share that knowledge. So I think you're right. Having just kind of more exposure to that. I will say in the last five or so years, there has been a better I think, trend to exposure, would you say that we're headed in the right direction or do you think we're still kind of in the dark ages of, of that, that gap being filled? Ooh, damn, that's uh, quite a phraseology there. I think in some, ways is we're, in some ways we're always gonna be in the dark ages. Like we're always gonna be like not aware of what we don't know. And that to me is the most dangerous thing or we're gonna be too damn sure about what we don't really know. Um, Take, for example, knee alignment, like you mentioned, like the MCL. Like if you look at some of the Southern fist styles, when they do their ma, the feet are like pointed straight ahead, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the knees are supposed to track right over the toes. And then, you know, you'll hear people say like, oh, if you're, if you're squatting that low and your feet are pointing, your feet are strict parallel and pointing straight ahead, that's too much torque on the knee. My question to them is torque on whose knee? Like if you grew up and you have a hard time even just like bending your knee in a, such a way that tracks over your toes mm -hmm. and like you squatting like that for any length of time is a new thing, then yeah, okay, maybe you want to start with your ma, we foot positioning toes pointed out so your knees align over your toes. But if you've already got that soft tissue elasticity plus that strength, then I, and, you're, and you have the arch strength on top of that, then that kind of rotational power that you're getting from keeping your feet straight and prying your knees out and sitting your butt down at the same height as your knees, that's different because you are now asking a question of the body or of a body that's already been prepared. So context again is king. I think that's yeah. very important for a lot of people to realize. I think so too. There was actually this YouTube video that I had to get taken down and I, I usually just let a lot of stuff go, but it was like literally a video of a bunch of things my father does because he's a little bit superhuman. Like I, my husband and yeah. I have looked at him and we're like, yeah, he's superhuman. So, you know, he does a lot of those stances where his knee doesn't align, but my husband's like, yeah, but his tissue, his body, he's moved like this forever. He's conditioned in a way that, um, on whose knee, like you said, on whose, like you're, right. it, it's like how you, so it's just like anything else. It's in training in repetition safely though. Right. And so this is what I try to help bridge that gap, even at my school, like with an instructor, like they maybe have been doing this since they were four years old. So for them, they can squat no problem e either way. But I'm like, Hey, this guy's 42. He's just coming in here for the first time, never done physical activity. You have to learn that, ex like to, to kind of bridge that and explain like that their body's not ready. You have to take them through this side of it and, and like find that scale of progression and regression. And um, that's something that we learned totally. from the great Mike Boyle. And uh, it's been, it's been fascinating to be able to bridge that. And that's why I was so excited to talk to you because you not only come from the martial background, but the, but you do the FMS and your FSG and, and just like, there's just so many things that I'm curious in how 
you've been able to take from all of these different expert um, fields and kind of meld them into one and like what what drew you to those different organizations? So of course you have your own background, but um, I know that you specifically are, are active in FMS and FSFG and I'm sure um, maybe some other things you can fill me in. Honestly, everything, uh, this is gonna sound like kind of a, a, a blow off answer, but honestly, like I feel like almost everything good that's happened in my life is sheer luck. <laughs> um, I, I'm not saying that, to be humble, I'm saying that God's honest truth. Um, like the only thing that I can say that like I maybe have pushed for on, on my own is just like out of love, martial arts. Mm -hmm. Like I've loved martial arts since I was a kid. And it, so I always say that like um, the martial arts are the source of everything good that's come into my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so starting from traditional martial arts, um, you know, I, I was really fortunate. I mean, I didn't really get to start training formally until like I came out to LA for college. Mm -hmm. um, I had a little bit of training from my father, just, you know, my dad taught me some Tai Chi when I was a kid. Um, and so it was great to get my teeth um, into some of the martial arts with that. But as far as really training, like I didn't, I started training um, Shotokan Karate with Tsutomo Oishima, who um, for your karate people, um, uh, they'll know him as the guy who translated Karate do Kyohan. So he's like, uh, you know, one of the true pioneers of Shotokan here in the States. Um, around the same time, I started training with a Shaolin master named Andy Hong. Um, also started training with the late Professor Daniel Lee, um, who was Yang style Taiji and uh, also uh, one of the, well, probably most well known as a student of Bruce Lee's. Um, so those are just the three that I, I started training with right when I got to SoCal. Um, never mind um, others who are like my, you know, my late Sifu and Fatgaku and Arthur Lee um, and his son Harlan, um, my Swaijiao, my first Swaijiao teacher, Dr. Daniel Wong, um, and then my, my Swaijiao master, Grandmaster David Lin, um, who's uh, since regrettably passed yes, away. Yes. A bunch of other, I um, mean, you know, a bunch of other teachers. And like now I spend the majority of my time training at the Inasano Academy. I um, mean, everyone in the world of martial arts pretty much knows exactly who Goro Dan and Asano is. Mm -hmm. So um, martial arts for me has been like an intrinsic. Um, it's always been part of my life. And I think until my last breath, it will certainly be. <laughs> um, but everything else from there is kind of like dumb luck. As far as strength training outside of martial arts, um, one time I was treating um, Guru and Asano. So actually, it's a funny story about how I got to meet him. Um, I was treating a C-Lot master, um, the late Victor Dutois, um, and Pak Vic um, said, oh my God, this is great. You're helping me so much. Uh, you should really meet one of my students. I go, oh, that'd be an honor, sir. Um, you know, he goes, oh, I'm sure you've heard of him. I go, oh, uh, who is he, sir? He goes, Dan Inosanto. And I go, wow, well, yeah, I've heard of him, sir. No, no doubt about it. And so he, um, I think he texted Guru Dan and then Guru came in and was like, hi, um, you know, I'm Dan and Asana. I go, I know exactly who you are, sir. Yeah. So it was cool. Um, my, how I got to meet him was as a you know, patient and provider. Right, right. Uh, type interaction. So that um, was kind of what opened the door to a bunch of other things. He one time came into the office and said, doc, I have a favor to ask you. I'm like, sure, sir, anything you want. Um, he goes, well, you've got my lower back feeling good and it hasn't felt this good for the first time in like forever. Um, but one of my students, um, paid for these sessions for me to be training with this Russian weightlifting coach. And I'm kind of worried. And like, you know, for the first time my back feels good. I don't know what this coach is going to do. I don't know what he's about. Like, would you mind being there to observe so that like, if I get hurt, you can be like either put me back together and or the voice, <laughs> like the medical voice to say, Stop. right. I go, yeah, sure. Be glad to. Who is the Russian weightlifting coach? Pavel Tsitsuli. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> um, yeah. And so that's how I, I mean, that's, that was my first exposure to kettlebells directly mm -hmm. through Pavel. Wow. Um, and so, you know, Guru started training directly with Pavel uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and, um, Guru asked me to be there for the sessions. And then at one point, I can't remember if it was Pavel himself or Roy Harris, who was also there at the time said something like, so you're going to man up and join us today. So I was like, <laughs> uh, well, 
<laughs> so that's how I, I got into kettlebell. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I think it's amazing though, because I, and I don't want to sound all like, you know, oh man, it's mystical or anything because it's just like such a stereotype. But I feel like there's something to be said for the luck part because I feel like you put out good energy in the world. You're doing good things and helping people. And that's just what happens. Like people like to say to me or even my father, oh, you're so lucky. I'm like, I don't know if it's just luck. I think it's hard work. I think it's like, you know, putting out that good energy. And so I think that has a lot to do with it as well. And there is being in the right time and right place. There is some luck, but I, I think that's awesome. It's so amazing. And, and so since then though, you really manned up and you're like, you went all the way with the kettlebells. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big part oh, of your well, life. I'm still, I'm just, I'm still, I feel like I'm going probably the other direction instead of like growing upward and outward, uh, even though I'm luck, I've been, you know, privileged to be ranked as a master instructor as an SFG. Um, I feel like now the more I train, the more I'm going back to what I call the three Kings mm -hmm. um, of lifts, which to me are the swing slash deadlift, the get up and the squat. Um, the more I look at those three, the more I, I see just like, there's so much value in them as far as fundamentals that people gloss over that I, it, and especially in terms of rehabilitative stuff, like for me, my mantra, my guiding principle is make every rep rehabilitative. So if you're trying to do something as a gut check, that's great as far as testing, but as far as training, training to me is about like making the envelope bigger, not like trying to put micro tears in it, but like actually just, how can we make that envelope wider and more thick, more resilient? Um, so when I look at the swing, the get up and the squat, man, I, there's just so much in there that it's, it's like I, I could spend forever just investigating and improving how I do those. And I have a feeling your martial art background has a lot to do with your principle and thinking in that as well, right? Because martial arts is very much about going deeper and exploring and spending hours on maybe one movement. And a true martial artist knows this anyway, not just the guy who comes in off the street and is like, I want to learn all the weapons here and how to fly like Jet Li in this movie or whatever, right? Like a real martial artist knows that the fundamentals and the basics is what is advanced. Like that is the higher level of learning, right? And so I feel like there's such a connection because I, I, I am such a, a newbie when it comes to kettlebells. I've been quote unquote trying to do them for a long time, but uh, that's kind of my husband's wrong. But I really enjoy it because I really felt like there was a bit of that. Like I love the swing, the get up and like the squat, right? Like, so you're, I feel like martial artists tend to take to that. And then, and um, so I love that you kind of mentioned that. I feel like that might kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, and also too, like with the FMS, I mean, one of the things that Gray Cook talks a lot about is it's like, we should train the deadlift and preserve or maintain the squat. So like, as far as the squat goes, like to me, there's, there's so much hip health. And um, one of my colleagues, I believe, I can't remember who, so I don't want to name names and of be course. corrected later on. <laughs> but uh, one of my colleagues, I think, uh, made it, posted a paper or published a paper saying that there's like a one-to-one -one correlation between anterior hip restriction or immobility and lower back pain. So it's like, if we have good hip control, good hip mobility, good hip strength, and are able to express that strength through a variety of ranges of motion, that's like an insurance policy on our backs. Like mm -hmm. who wouldn't want that? Yeah. And that's such, a, I feel like it's such a misunderstood exercise, the squat, right? Most people like, whether you're a martial artist, a strength trainer or anything, or just general population, people always say, I can't squat because I have a bad back or bad knee. And, I mean, and we're always like, that's exactly why you should be, you know, learning to do this movement and doing it safely. I think it's really has this bad reputation for it's only for people who have perfect mobility or who are young. And I would then tell them to look at Asian elderly people who are squatting and like preparing food all day. And that's the position they're in. And and there's something about that. Like we're born, we, we move around, we roll around and we get up and like squatting is just so natural. And it's something that we lose because of these wonderful things that we call chairs that have, um, you know, kind of caused us to be, be a bit lazy. But maybe if you could talk a little bit about, a little bit more about kind of that health benefit, because I think that people need to kind of hear that connectivity of why they need to do the squat and why um, it's exactly for 
what people counterintuitively think. It's interesting because one of my colleagues talks about, um, actually Mark Rifkin uh, talks about the body as a conservative system, like what you don't use, you lose. Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely that much as far as the squat. Um, as you mentioned, with, with, in Western society, we use these chairs. So like we're getting really good at like sitting for extended periods of time in situations where our, our hip joints are bent 90 degrees or ish, because depending on how much we slouch and let our butts slide forward on the chair, maybe our hips are not even flexed at 90 degrees and more like of an obtuse angle and more of that flexion is coming from our lumbar spines. But um, if you look at the deep squat, like the, you know, the, the ground squat, right? Like that, that's maximal. We're looking at more maximal ranges of motion as far as hip flexion. You know, we've, like you said, become lazy because of whatever. There's acculturation. Don't sit on the floor. Don't squat on the floor. It's dirty down there. It's primitive down there. Oh, it's low class down there. While chairs definitely make it easier for us to be able to come back to standing, they also rob us of the ability to control those ranges of motion that we had naturally as little kids. And so like people then go, go into all of these interesting arguments about like, oh, well, you know, this ethnicity's hips are meant for squatting, that ethnicity's hips are not meant for squatting. To me, that's all trash. Um, and, you know, I know that comes across as a little bit hard, but like, let's talk about it for what it is. I don't think it's an issue of genetics because if we took people from across the genetic spectrum and raised them from infancy all the way up to adulthood, squatting all the way down and sitting on the ground and getting up and down from the ground, like genetic expression is going to be genetic expression, but I can guarantee you that they'll all still be able to maintain the squat and be able to get up and down. Now, when you look at changes in culture, meaning like, oh, well, you know, since the 1600s or the 1700s, the no nobles and the aristocrats were sitting in chairs. Well, then, of course, there's going to be different skeletal expression because of soft tissue load. So, you know, I, I think it's really important for us to be able to contextualize that. Yeah. People are going to be really quick to saying that like, oh, no, 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 no. This person's hips aren't meant to squat. I call bullshit on it. So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what like you can look at every nationality of baby and they're all they're all able to squat, right? It's not like, oh, this ethnicity's never been able to. So it's a matter of you you don't use it, you lose it. Right? Which is why And <laughs> Yeah, and and really what you train your body will remold to, right? Like mm -hmm take a guy like a Masoyama that's going to be punching stuff all day long or um, uh, Higona Sensei and Goju Ryu. Like these guys have like wicked knuckle yeah. power, right? And it's, and why? Because there's a, you know, specific adaptation to impose demand. Like you put a demand on a particular set of tissues or on a structure, then there's going to be an adaptation, mm -hmm. right? So like if your body only has to adapt to sitting in a chair, there's going to be a soft tissue adaptation. When the soft tissue adapts in a certain way, whether that's building greater capacity to do something or losing the capacity to do something, the skeleton will then remold because that soft tissue is pulling on it in different ways. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, like, until we can contextualize that throughout the course of life and understand that, like, okay, up to age three or four, these kids were on the floor, they were playing, they were sitting on the floor, they were rolling around, they're doing all the things that little kids do. And then once they were old enough to quote unquote follow instructions and behave, then they start sitting in chairs, working on tables, not able to fully flex, not fully able to extend. Then, then we realize that it's our acculturation that's robbing us of those ranges of motion. Yeah, I, I love that explanation. And what I think you, would be also valuable is if you could also share that people saying, well, it's too late for me now. Because I know, I don't know much about it, but my husband always says, oh, your cells every year, you know, your tissue changes. And so like, maybe you could kind of speak to that where people are like, well, I'm not five anymore. I'm already in my thirties or forties or that it's just too late, right? Like they're, they're kind of giving up on the idea that their body can do certain things. What age did you just say? Was that 30s and 40s? <laughs> That's what I, I have people who are, are, are denying wow. that they're able to do it. <laughs> well, you, wow. you've had okay. students, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. <laughs> totally. Um, so here's an interesting vignette for you. Um, I was working with um, a celebrity musician's wife mm -hmm. um, as a private student. And 
um, I was actually training her in Tai Chi at the time and focusing a lot on just like awareness of posture um, and movement while maintaining that posture rather than going like what we normally do. Human beings, like when we start investigating something, we automatically bring our eyes and our heads and our necks closer. So from profile view, right, if I'm standing up straight, but I'm reading something, I'll go like, uh, my eyes will reorient to be able to see that more efficiently, right? right? The problem is that over time, like I'll start looking more and more and more like this. So then there's more of that neck flexion. So with this musician's wife, one of the things that we worked on was like, okay, I want you to be aware of when you're doing these movements and you're actually like focusing on your hands rather than like actually letting your hands kind of revolve around you like a gyroscope. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because she came back to me after one, uh, one session and uh, I remember she told me that she'd been to see her doctor for a physical and she goes, I got to tell you about my doctor's appointment. And I was just like, Ooh, is this going to be good or bad? Right. Like normally when a client says like, yeah, we, I, I really want to talk to you about what happened at this doctor's appointment. I'm like, <laughs> and they're like, should I be biting my nails about this? And she goes, you know, my doctor gave me a, just a general physical and then like, you know, wanted to see how I'm doing as far as everything else. But they measured my height four times. And I'm like, are you, was there a problem? And she goes, well, he thought so at the beginning because like he read the chart and like I'd grown an inch and a half. Mm -hmm. And at the time she was, I believe, 60 or 65. So yeah, to me, that, that tells you that like, if you're, if you can change skeletal alignment, because you're aware of soft tissue engagement and you know, that's neurological perception, right? Like your brain perceives like, okay, this is sitting up straight versus like, oh, okay, this is sitting up straight. Mm -hmm. You know, these little things, as far as like, we think we're sitting up straight versus like, we're actually mechanically sitting up straight. There's so much other possibility that can happen. Like if our soft tissues, if our muscles put a different load on our bones, then our bones over time will remodel. Now there's a limit to everything, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of us who have like bony degenerative changes have those degenerative changes because we've been training in a certain way. And unfortunately, some of us define ourselves by that kind of training. Yeah. So like, no, no, I have to train this way because that's how I train. Yeah, but no, I mean, even language changes, right? Like, I mean, how many, if you go to Hong Kong today, like the Cantonese you hear today, is going to be way different than the Cantonese you heard back in the 80s. Yeah. So yeah. like, I think the things that we think of as cast in stone, uh, really, including our skeletons in a lot of ways, need to be revisited in terms of perspective. Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because you have this um, perspective of being able to take the the science side. So you kind of become like an authority on it. Like people believe, do they believe you more since you have the doctor or do you find it's still a bit of a challenge because people are very resistant, I find, to wanting to change. Like even if you're telling them, hey, you can change, you would think that would be great news. But a lot of times I find there's so much resistance to the work that may be involved in that change. And I wonder if, um, you know, as, as a fellow uh, teacher and, and all that, but maybe you've got the doctor and that kind of helps you, or do you feel like people are just resistant and that's their nature? Um, I think people, so uh, another friend of mine, Peter Crone, um, has a great saying in the, in that um, people's biggest addictions are to their history or to their past. Um, and so people like to define themselves like, no, no, it's this way for me. So that's how it is, how it is for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so people will define themselves based on that. Uh, it's been my experience that on the other hand, if you challenge someone with the right string, like you know how to pull on just the right string of challenge, like not in such a way to disrespect them or, or irritate them or whatever, but just like dangle the carrot and just, a, just enough of a way that they want to chase it mm -hmm. because their ego now got called into play. Mm -hmm. um, and you dangle the right carrot, meaning like you give them the right goal that like is going to move them in the right direction that you can enact change. So right. do I think it's an issue of, of 
initials after a name? I don't think so. I think it's how it's what's incumbent upon us mm -hmm. is more how do we communicate? And our communication skills are going to come from our own level of understanding. So we as hopeful change makers need to do a better job of understanding the situations at play, not only in terms of like what the ideal is, but also empathizing better on, about like this is what this person is coming to the table with like okay yeah they need to squat and they were told not to squat because their knees hurt their back hurts their neck hurts that like the laundry list and the litany of things but it's a incumbent on us as movement professionals as wellness professionals as high performance professionals as medical professionals as kids you know mm -hmm. kids to our parents as parents to our kids whatever as leaders to be able to say okay let's do this first so like coach Boyle would say like you know making the right progressions and regressions but the the term that i use a lot is stepping stones mm -hmm. right like if i wanted to cross a pond if the stepping stones are too far apart then i may have to like struggle to make that leap and if i don't have that kind of jumping skill i'm going to end up in the drink now for people that don't necessarily have that kind of motivation to get to the other side and they don't want to end up wet so they don't want to be intimidated so it's up to us to make those stepping stones achievable like one of the things i talk about with k3 my in my current project um is that every every endeavor that we do in training should have three considerations what i call the three kings of programming and if you can't answer yes to all three of these things, it shouldn't be in your program. Is what I want to do beneficial? Is it challenging? And is it fun? If it's not beneficial, why do it? If it's not challenging, then you won't grow. You won't adapt. If it's not fun, you'll resent it. So there will be a kind of emotional slash hormonal negative reaction to it. Mm -hmm. Meaning like, crap, I don't want to see that kettlebell again. Or like, oh my God, I got to do like the you know, die pa again. Oh, I hate that thing. Like whatever the, the exercise is, right? If there's a resentment to it, then maybe let's go down a different road. Like let's find something that you can do that you enjoy that's going to help you break into that skill set that you resent. Yeah. So when it comes to squatting, teaching people like, okay, great. I want you to just work on this first. See if you can get your back really straight and then pry your knees apart like a gentle plie right? Working on that first. Instead of using the term squat, which people automatically have in, like a, in some people, like, like mm -hmm. you're saying, like the people that, that are the resistant ones that you might be working with, like just giving them a, an exercise like, hey, I'll challenge you with this. Can you try this? Mm -hmm. See how your body does with that. Oh man, that's some work. Oh man, I'm really feeling it in these muscles. Awesome. You know that those muscles are the ones that are going to help make the squat accessible to that client or to that athlete or that patient, but they don't have to know that. Mm -hmm. They just have to know that like, unless they want to squat and that is their goal, it's their stated goal, like all they can feel out is like, oh my God, I've been really working these muscles. Right. Amy really trained me so well. So like, that's, that's the thing to me, like mm -hmm. you've got to understand your subject matter and then understand how to communicate like and empathize as well. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I, I enjoyed reading um, on your website was one of the philosophies that kind of ties us into something that you spoke about earlier, which was in the beginning, which was, you know, here in this country, it's, it's more, 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 and it's go, go, go. And um, Oscar and I just did a podcast on the impatience of uh, the society that we're in to want to have results immediately. And one of the quotes on your site, and I'll, I'll list the whole thing here, but it's, you start with slowness is the mother of all good movements. And I just love that because it resonates on so many levels. Perhaps you can expand on it and why it was so important for you to, to write. Um, gosh, I should really look up that whole quote. Um, because <laughs> I it's have quite it. a long quote. <laughs> yeah. God, the, yeah. The, the, I'll, in fact, I will look it up right now. I may actually have it, but um, the, the whole quote was an interesting one because it, it really talks about how like, there are so many attributes that we can't access until we learn how to go slow. Um, and I think, like, if you look at sports, for example, right? Like, if there's an event that happens, like, let's, let's watch this replay. And so automatically the announcer or the commentator will say, let's watch this replay. 
And we watch the replay first at speed, and then we watch it slow-mo. And slow-mo allows us the time and the leisure to be able to perceive things in greater detail. The problem with like doing things in our like take it for granted speed is that little things creep in, little errors or little glitches creep in, and we don't have the chance to become aware of them. And if we're not aware of these issues, we can't address them. So like, I always use the example of tone of voice, right? Like it, it, people, especially in relationships will say like, I'd appreciate it if you didn't speak to me with that tone of voice or something along those lines. And then the partner might say like, well, I wasn't using a tone of voice. I don't know what you're talking about. And then they'll like, they, they might <laughs> body language or whatever, throw out some sort of resistance or some sort of de defensiveness. And it's unconscious, like not even subconscious, totally unconscious. They don't even know they're doing. It. And so the, the, that kind of slow-mo playback allows you to take the heat off of something and give you a chance of, uh, of perception, developing perception in a lower pressure environment. So if we want to be able to move well, let's practice moving slower so we can perceive all those little losses of control along the way. Same thing with speech, same thing with like, uh, you know, how we're breathing, same thing with our lives. Like I can say for myself as a dad, like when my son was born, I was so like, up to my eyeballs in the rat race that as a dad, I don't think I was, I was really that present for him in a lot of ways. Like I tried to do a lot of stuff with him, but I was so like, I was at LAX probably like at certain points, like three times a week. Um, so I, uh, you know, I not so jokingly said that I was seeing more of the airport than I was of my own living room. Um, and so that was in some ways great because like, I got to accomplish a lot. I got to achieve a lot. I got to do a lot, but, um, in pushing so hard, pushing so fast, trying to do so much, I missed out on a lot of stuff uh, as far as being a father. So, yeah, I think as we slow down, appreciating that, that speed has um it's almost like a dimmer switch like my colleague dr jimmy yuan one of my best friends says slow is a speed and so like if we learn to train at these different speeds we develop greater mastery mm -hmm. yeah i think also this last year has kind of pushed everybody to slow down a little bit right like we kind of were forced into this situation where hopefully people use that time to take that step back and and be able to take advantage of okay you're staying home right now you're st stop and and then reset now we're going to do this it's been this very forced lesson in patience i think in, on so many levels with the pandemic and um it's just it's fascinating and i know that those that have been continuing some sort of health regimen or fitness training have all fared a lot better like we've been doing a lot of outreach with people on the ones that are at our school and they've, they've been great because they're continuing. And then we've tried to reach out to the ones that have just not been able to make it back in. And you can just feel the difference in, in those that have been able to keep some consistency and some norm normalcy in their lives. And, but I think the slowness just, I don't know if it's a slowness, but I think just the whole situation has been just kind of crazy for everybody. But I think that forced, when you're forced to, be confronted with that. I think it's, it's very telling in what our nature is and then how to approach it. Right. And so, um, another thing I wanted to ask you about was kind of your upbringing. Cause you, you mentioned you were born in the States and, um, of course, Asian American and right now is a, a interesting time to be Asian American. It's always been an interesting time to be Asian American, but it's been a controversial time, I guess would be more of the thing uh, I, it, as more information has come out into the public. But what was life growing up for you? Did you grow up in California? I grew up in Delaware. In Delaware. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just up the coast. Yeah. yeah so you're an East Coaster. <laughs> Sort of. Originally, originally. Yeah. yeah. I've been I've been out in LA the majority of my life. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, you're very West Coast. But so what what was your experience growing <laughs> up? I always find it interesting because I born in Boston but grew up in Florida, which is not if I had grown up in Boston, I think my perception of being Asian American would be very different. There's a Chinatown there. Um it's very different than Orlando, Florida. So I was just I'm always curious as what 
the experience was um, for you. And then um, we can talk a little later about how things are going right now with, with the world. <laughs> yeah, God. Uh, yeah. I think in a lot of ways that could almost be a whole other episode. Um, <laughs> growing up, honestly. Um, yeah, growing up, it was very different. I mean, Delaware of the 70s versus, um, you know, LA of now. It's like night. I mean, LA, even when I first got to LA back in 90, um, mm -hmm. it was night and day from Delaware. I mean, Delaware yeah. back then in the 70s was a very, like, predominantly Caucasian, like not even that many black families, mm -hmm. um, negligible amount of Latinos and like even fewer Asians. So like, uh, I, I remember for a lot of people, I was like one of the first Asians they'd seen. So it was like, wow, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So you didn't stand and, out and much. <laughs> no, not at all. No. <laughs> And I didn't have the long hair back then. This is a much more recent development. <laughs> yeah, that would much definitely. And this is not but since. I don't know. In the seventies, it may have been a, a bit of a, a thing. <laughs> yeah, it could have been. But yeah, my parents were pretty conservative, so yeah, none of that. Um, yeah, and this is not pandemic length growth. No, like I, uh, this was pre-pandemic. Oh, so. Okay. <laughs> But yeah. I mean, um, you know, we it, it's such a hot topic now having a, a lot of the anti-Asian um, hate crimes yeah. and racism that's happening now. I wonder, though, did you experience, you know, what a lot of people are feeling now, even as a child growing up, especially being sure. surrounded by um, being kind of alone, you know, feeling that loneliness, it's feeling definitely. that isolation. And did you ever have that feeling of wanting to blend in, like wishing you weren't Asian when you were young? You know, I mean, these are like things children go through. So I'm really curious what that, if you don't mind sharing, of course, um, what that experience no, was. No, like. not at all. I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll glad, gladly speak on that with absolute honesty. Um, yeah, as a kid growing up, like I, you know, looked on, looked at media all the time and be like, you know, there's no one like me on the media other than like, Bruce Lee or Saturday afternoon Kung Fu theater, mm -hmm. right? So being that those were like my, my archetypes as far as Asian male outside of my dad, it was like, yeah, okay, I think that's what I want to do. I want to learn martial arts. So that might have been what, what originally drew me to martial arts. But certainly, like, there were a lot of times when, like, as a kid growing up, uh, either bullied or being bullied or getting into scraps because of, you know, the color of my skin or people, like, wanting to pick fights, you know, like, Hey, Chink, whatever. I mean, like there, were, you named the epithet. I'm sure I heard it. Um, and I think that also too pushed me or motivated me more to want to learn martial arts because it's like, I don't want to physically be at the mercy of someone else's goodness, yeah. you know? And while we can say optimistically like, yeah, oh yeah, all people are in, in the, at their core good. I don't agree with that. I don't yeah. also, I, just as easily, I don't think that all people are bad. I think that all people are opportunistic. So when it behooves them to be good, they will be good. When it behooves them to be bad or allows them to kind of like, they feel like they can get away with being bad, people will do shady stuff. So not being myopic and not being kind of like um, delusional, like I know that seems like a strong word, but really like, I think that's one of the things that, that we in this generation, and certainly in today's situation, need to take a hard and honest look at is that like we can't delude ourselves into thinking if we behave then bad things won't happen to us like the old the old Thai man who was a murdered, murdered you know yeah murdered I mean let's call it what it was he was murdered by someone who was like supposedly throwing a temper tantrum like let's call it what it is you know that was a murder Mm -hmm. He was minding his own business. And so what, he was he not behaving? Was he at fault? Like, I'd, I'd love to hear some of these apologists talking about like, oh, no, 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 it, you know, it's his fault in some way, shape or form. No, it isn't. Right. Absolutely not. The only thing that is at fault in my mind is that like, we as Asian Americans are all too often taught to keep your head down, work hard, you know, Blend don't rock in. the boat blend in right yeah. assimilate and you know for me as a kid like my parents brought me up speaking English um and not Mandarin and, or not Cantonese because like they wanted me to do well in English they wanted me to like have that kind of like assimilation experience mm -hmm. on the other hand like you know now we know like you have a sense of identity you have a sense of culture you have a sense of like being able to communicate and a competitive advantage being able to be multilingual so you know, 
we can we can say that hindsight's twenty twenty. But yeah, I mean, like these are things that I think culture is important. Strength is important. So like in Strong First, there's a you know a, a saying that strength has a greater purpose, and not just in terms of lifting, but also strength in terms of like character, strength to endure, but also strength to exert. Right, like if someone wants to threaten your safety or threaten the safety of someone you care about, you having the wherewithal to be able to dominate that situation or at least handle or, or diffuse that situation in a way that like allows you to continue to survive and thrive is clutch and something that I think older generation Asian Americans and certainly some even our age and younger don't really respect enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been a really frustrating time. And of course, this all started last year around the pandemic. But if you rewind and we can do the historical talk, and I am not a historian, but I mean, this is not a new thing um, for racism to exist against Asians. Like many Asian Americans that I've spoken to have shared similar experiences as yourself, where they were kind of the one token Asian person in their class, or, you know, I was like one of three, the other two being Filipino, right? So it's kind of, it's just, you have these feelings that a lot of people really can't identify with, because even my husband, um, you know, he's, he's a Latino male, right? But he also grew up in a dynamic where he wasn't the one Latino male amongst, you know, all these different dynamics. I mean, he eventually ended up being there because he would, he went out to a private school out, out of his borough, but it's mm-hmm. like a very different feeling. Cause I, you know, shared, well, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to fit in more, you know, whereas, you know, as I got older, it didn't take very long, but as I got older, I was very much embracing who I am and my martial art background. And I think I went in the polar opposite, but as a young child, you just don't want to get picked on or looked at weird because you have a really weird lunch. You don't have a sandwich like everyone else. You have like fried rice and chicken and veggies and, you know, just even something as similar, as simple as that, right? You just feel like you don't fit in. And I, I think that, I hope that as time goes on, like we look at now, like I look at my, all the young kids around me that are Asian American, like they don't have those same experiences because hopefully people are more aware, but then you see on the news, elderly people getting attacked and then, our former president um, basically inciting that violence and and encouraging the hate, right? And so it's like, are we moving forward at all, or is it because it's it's just it's like we I feel like we're at a standstill and it's really frustrating. And then in some ways, we didn't know what was going on because there was no social media and all these like Instagrams and things where you could see something right away. Was, was that better or is it better now? Cause now we see all of this, but then it's, it's like so depressing. <laughs> I'll say we're in a better spot now and I will give he who I don't really care to name some credit <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, as far as, as far as dredging the swamp or draining the swamp, because I think it's, yeah, I, I think that there's some truth to that. There was the drainage of the swamp, but the drainage of the swamp ended up like draining everything out onto Main Street. So, um, you know, rather than draining it and then disposing of it, draining it and then putting it out in the light of day. So now we all have to deal with it. Now, on one hand, we could say that, ah, oh, damn, now I have to deal with all of this racism, all this violence, all this. But really, all of that was in the closet for decades. Mm-hmm. You know, having grown up with, some folks like that, I could tell you, like plenty of people that would, you know, use racial epithets, this, that, and the other, um, in, in, within the privacy of their own home or the, the, the safety of their own home, um, with like-minded folks or people that they trusted versus like out in the open. So for people to be in a situation, for our society to be in a situation where we now have to see it and we can now address it, I think is a, is a unique opportunity. It, unquestionably sucks that we have to do it and certainly like the damage like the folks the innocents who are being targeted who are suffering who are being assaulted who are being murdered who are being like evicted from their homes and now forced to deal with like homelessness and and issues like that who are being manipulated not only in terms of their health but in terms of their financial resources um yeah that's Unfortunately, part of the suffering we have to go through in the change, 
certainly the civil rights movement that of the 60s like there were plenty of people who were murdered during that to get us to the next stage but now we're on the next like if we had a, a like a, a period of quote unquote peace um that peace was hollow and false in a lot of ways and luckily we're at a stage i, I say luckily in some ways but in in a lot of ways hopefully for our later generations luckily we're in a situation now where we can at least admit and address those issues that have been heretofore kind of swept under the rug or hidden in the closet whereas now we are like people are coming out like full-on screaming like coming uh out into the light of day out of the swamp so to speak and speaking their minds speaking their hearts and even though what we're seeing is a lot of hate a lot of small mindedness, a lot of bigotry, a lot of fear, a lot of violence. Um, at least we can now address that rather than like pretending that everything's okay because it wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, I definitely like to know who's on my side, right? Or who's my enemy, so to speak, or, you know, because it is, it's, it, it's shocking to have seen, um, and hear some of the things that I've been exposed to in the last year. And, and just, you just don't, you don't realize um, where people stand until, until there's an opportunity for their true colors to show. And I, and I really do believe um, to be silent is to be complicit. And, and I've, which is honestly one of the reasons I started this podcast was to be able to share other people's stories, to build empathy and to um, speak out against the things that I feel um, need to be mentioned. So I do appreciate you sharing all of that. I think it's super important. I know you as a parent must have to articulate to your kids. Like how do you articulate in a time where they see something like that that time in be murdered, just like I would, uh, you know, speak to a lot of my, you know, African American friends. Like, how do you talk to your kids about? Well, these things happen because we look the way we, the, the way we look. Like, I I don't have to to articulate that. I mean, Oscar and I don't have children, but I mean, we mentor kids. But it's very different having to talk to your own kids. Like, what is that like for you? It's uh, for me personally, it's uh, there, it falls into the category of things I wish I didn't have to do kind of like bookkeeping, but <laughs> um, no, really. I mean, like, I wish I didn't have to have that talk with my kids. And I certainly never imagined that at, in the 2020s, right in this decade, we'd ha we'd be having to have this discussion. I never imagined this growing up. Mm -hmm. um, certainly when president Obama was elected, like I remember sitting in, my father was visiting at the time when the election results were, were announced um, for that election. And my father, I remember him crying tears of joy, saying like, this is like amazing, son. You don't understand. And I go, what do you mean, dad? And he's like, in my lifetime, I never imagined that there'd be a black president. And like, there's, there's hope. And I, I just like, even now as I retell yeah. this, I'm like, I have goosebumps, you know? Um, but you know, to tell my kids like, hey, you know, this is just reality. This is reality. There are people out there who will attack you just because of the color of your skin. Understand that. Like, don't be freaked out about it. Don't be paralyzed by, a, by it. Don't be like fearful of it. Don't be hypervigilant, but just like pay attention. Like someone may come and attack you and may say things to you that you think are unfair, whatever. Don't wonder why, just get the hell out of the way or take evasive action and understand that that's that that's just part of how it works i mean like in crossing a street as you walk across the street there is the possibility that even though there's a stop sign and you're in a well-marked crosswalk that there's going to be a driver that doesn't pay attention now i can stand in the crosswalk and then like glare that driver down and say like well you're violating the law but if they're not paying attention and their stereo is on full blast i'm going to end up as roadkill so rather than getting fixated on right and wrong i want to teach my kids like there's survival and there's reality and there's physics right like if someone's attacking you don't worry about all of the social commentary first get the hell out of the way or you know if it's someone that you can physically um you know master or dominate and you're in a situation where you can't escape exert that like you are you have been trained in martial arts since you were little like you have at least some kind of physical option 
You know how to handle your body. So exercise those options. But understand too that like there are people out there that will do certain things and it's not your not in your best interest to get caught up in the why it's in your best interest to understand that like you need to evade escape whatever right the why is going to be part of a bigger conversation when you're not having to deal with survival Mm -hmm. yeah and in the same way earlier, we were talking about how, you know, we have all these traditional backgrounds and we do our training, but now we have science and we meld the two. I, I love hearing what you just shared because as much as I, I mean, my parents were the best, all I, my whole life is dedicated to pretty much doing whatever I can for them. But that generation, and I don't know if it's the same for you and I don't want to generalize, but you know, a lot is not said right? There's a lot, like you said, it's just a kind of be quiet oh, yeah. under the rug. We don't know. No, we don't shake the bow. We don't talk about that. And even though, you know, they have um, pretty much raised me with the beliefs I have. So there's something there to that, but it's like being open and, and sharing things. Like I'm a very, very strong advocate for, um, for children learning about um, personal space and their body identity and their sexual identity and things like that, because um, you know I'm a survivor, and so like I I I really appreciate that that hope that our generation and those after us can be so much open, more open with the next generation and so on and so on. Because especially in the Asian American community, I find as, as um, that first generation from, from immigrants, right? Like you get very little in terms of guidance with these social cues and, and things that I think would have helped a lot, a lot along the way. And I think we have this opportunity to educate the youth in a, in a way that, you know, we just didn't get, and you know, all parents do the best they can. And uh, in no way am I, um, I'm saying it was this like neglected child, but there's so much, <laughs> especially in Asian culture, that is taboo to talk about mental health, um, you know, all of that. So certainly, so certainly. I, I mean, and then look at it on a societal level, right? Like, let's say, um, as a parent, like looking at, at, at issues such as postpartum, right? Like that back in the day, and actually, a, a big applause to um, the entertainment industry, um, even Daredevil right? I don't know if you caught any of those episodes, right? They talked about Matt Murdock and like how his mother abandoned him and like in the situations around that. And one of the things that they talked about during one of those episodes was like back then they didn't know what was going on. They just mm-hmm. thought that something was amiss and for whatever reason she was a bad mom. But like the behaviors that she was manifesting were due to postpartum depression. Yeah. And so like I think a lot of what we're aware of now we can contextualize better now. Mm -hmm. Um, should give us a greater empathy and understanding and so hopefully like these issues that we were we were taught to avoid or taught were taboo back then like hopefully now we can address them with some intelligence Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely well I know where we like you said all of the subjects that I like to touch on is like oh that could be its own episode so we'll we'll have to chat again for sure we're coming up on our time but I do want to ask you if there's any um anything that we need to um promote in terms of like, are there any books or are there any material? Are there any courses or things that you want to share with our listeners so that they can learn more about you and what you do? But um, it's been a fascinating conversation. So I really appreciate your time. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm honored. I mean, it's great to great, great, great to reconnect with you. Um, great to actually spend this time in conversation and great to have this, this, um, I, I think, really enjoyable and hopefully for your listeners enlightening um, talk as well. Yeah. Uh, really the best way of finding out what I'm involved with is on my social media. Um, mm-hmm. And so my handle is pretty much universal all across um, and it's D-R-M-A-R-K-C-H-E-N-G. So at Dr. Mark Chang. And so I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, Instagram, probably the, the best one to keep a, a finger on what I'm involved with. Um, and as far as products, um, the one thing that I'm involved with right now that as far as growing and developing is um, K3 Combat. And so that is a kind of distillation of um, all the things that you were speaking of at the beginning of the episode, like martial arts, strength mm-hmm. training, wellness and rehabilitation. Um, and so the, that project came about um, thanks to the urging of, like I said, my best friend, Jimmy Yuen, Dr. Jimmy Yuen. 
um, who said like, man, you got, you have so much stuff bubbling on your dome. Why don't you get it out there for the rest of the, the rest of the world? Um, and so originally the conversation was around like, how does, how does Dr. Mark Cheng train? Mm -hmm. And then it turned into like, okay, uh, rather than looking at what I do for martial arts and tactical purposes, then how can we take all of these things, all of these warrior traditions and use them to serve a greater slice of, of society looking at what can we use these for in terms of athlete preparation, in terms of injury rehabilitation, in terms of overall wellness, not in terms of just like, let's lose some fat and move better, but let's, from a 360 squared view, improve the human experience. And so that's what turned into K3 Combat Movement Systems. Awesome. Um, and so you can find out more about that at, at K3 Combat. Okay. And I'll definitely link all of that here for our listeners and possibly viewers. <laughs> uh, and, and, and again, uh, it was just such a pleasure to talk to you. I learned so much. Uh, I, I love having these conversations because it's pretty much just all about me and I get to learn everything. And so um, hopefully listeners get some advantage as well, but I, I actually am at the, at the receiving end of most of the benefits. So um, it was a pleasure and hopefully you'll come back and join us again soon. It'd be my honor. Thank you, Mimi. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to Culture Chat and hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please subscribe and rate my podcast. Feel free to leave me suggestions or send an email to Mimi at culturechatpodcast.com or follow me on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. 